I know I am the Irish guy, and Matthijs to to Manchester United is a match made in a pig's toilet bowl. Both of these parties are cursed. Two parties who consistently make a string of awful, terrible decisions. Dunedin is like your desperate, hopeless aunt who keeps getting into doomed relationships with penniless blokes who had pillow girlfriends until they were 24. Dunedin's career has been a tragedy. I'm not being overly dramatic. The last five years of his career, ever since quitting Ajax, he's been like watching the sequel to the Titanic. Trust me, Manji Stada is a sad, Final watery ending, sinking into the sea whilst Kate Winslet eats a donut on the door. I'm sorry, but look, five years ago, this young man was a superstar. Dalit had just helped Ajax come within a beaver's nose hair of reaching the actual Champions League final. He was the youngest ever captain of Ajax history. And if, if Lucas Moura had not morphed into Superman, being possessed by the ghost of Gareth Bale to score a stupendous once-in-a-lifetime hat-trick for Spurs, then this Dutch child would have lined out in the final against Liverpool. A Champions League final between Jurgen Klopp and Eric Ten Hag. Yeah, when those two did face off against each other a few years later, 7-0. Ouch. Well, yeah, De Ligt was a rock star. Literally, the most in-demand footballer in the world in 2019. The clamor for his signature, I've never seen anything like it. And definitely not for a centre-back, it was freakish. Suddenly, you had European giants across the world. These desperate chairmen would have probably eaten their own dog in a quiche to get this boy wonder unveiled at their club. As he, it was kind of sad. Like watching a bunch of comic book geeks pulling each other's hair and kneeling each other in the groin, fighting over who gets to sit beside the only girl in chess club. Look, people look at it and say that he looks like an arrogant mop head. But can you blame him? At 19 years of age, he was being offered £340,000 a week to play in France at PSG. The guy in Barcelona desperately wanting him, even making a last ditch attempt to steal him away from his Juventus medical, which again, a height of desperation. It's a bit like an awful rom-coms, some sweaty chump running through the airport to try and win back his love, and she's instead sharing an ice cream with some six-foot Gucci model. I don't care if he is arrogant, can you blame him? A teenage boy being offered insane amounts of money. He was the Justin Bieber of European football. To suddenly be exposed to such sickening wealth. I don't blame him for believing that his own poo smells of daffodils. I actually remember at the time thinking that it was nuts for turning down Barca. I mean, they had just won the Liga with ease, had reached the Champions League semi-final. <laughs> I did not think that within months they'd be letting Bayern Munich score eight goals against them in one match. I did not think they would embark on a financial meltdown leading to the expulsion of the greatest footballer of all time. Oh, I can only imagine the absolute state of Barcelona. If they had added another monster wage burden like the lit to their bank, within 12 months they'd be in so much death. The players would probably have to eat each other for lunch, like starving people stranded on an island after a plane crash. To be fair, I bet eating Sergio Busquets would be like chewing on a bony salad. At least Arturo Vidal would be in a proper meaty meal, like tucking into a wild pig. Well, as he goes to Juventus, who inserted a huge 135 million pound release clause in his contract, and gave him a rock star deal where if certain add-ons were met, then he could potentially be earning 416,000 pounds a week. To put it in context, Paolo Maldini is the defensive goat, and he never earned more than 30 grand a week at AC Milan. 30 grand. Something which is now a Darren Randolph wage? I mean, come on, Mino Riola managing to swing that sort of contract for this teenage raw centre back. A teenage boy who had never played anywhere outside of Holland. And we all know the Eredivisie is like a haunted pick and mix. I mean, shove your hand in. You could get some juicy Harry Potter eggs, or you could get a handful of your mum's chest hair. So for him to swing this transfer based off a couple of years in Dutch football, Wow! But it feels like the Litz decision making is cursed because he has always chosen the wrong broken club. He had his pick of Europe when he left Ajax. I mean, his first choice was apparently Barcelona, only to back away because Gerard Pique warned him that he wouldn't get any minutes, which is just the height of insecurity on Pique's part, literally trying to scare off the competition when they bumped into each other on a summer holiday. Oh, wow, that, that's a little creepy. A bit like being out to dinner with his girlfriend, he suddenly sees a younger, more handsome man smiling at her, so Pique decides to start barking like a dog before throwing cabbage in his face. Anyway, Dylan actually wanted to follow his buddy Frankie de Jong to the new camp, but if he had, it would have been a mess. And he would have been forced to leave pretty soon if he wanted to continue getting paid. He goes to Juventus instead. Again, another club about to be consumed by a wave of financial destruction. To such a degree where they literally told Cristiano Ronaldo they couldn't afford him no more. Imagine persuading one of the goats of the game to join and then pathetically having to ask him to leave a couple of years later. It's a bit like proposing to a mega celebrity pop star and then um, after two years, admitting you've run out of cash. So um, sh she should probably leave unless she wants to start chewing on the couch. Uh, honestly, 
Why do I get the feeling that's Oxlade Chamberlain's predicament right now? So let's join a Juventus team who'd won eight titles on the trust. He helps them win the title in his debut season. Although it was a drop off of seven points from the previous title win. And their 83 points was actually, was actually their lowest points total since they finished seventh in 2011. In his next two seasons, they finished an embarrassing fourth twice in a row. He goes to Bayern Munich again. A club who had just lifted 10 Bundesliga titles in a row. So in his debut season, they win it, yes. But with just 71 points, they squeaked the title on goal difference, owing everything to a Borussia Dortmund bottle job. And then in his second season, again, like in Italy, they somehow don't win the league, slipping to third. Either he chooses clubs terribly, or he is contributing to their collapse. Twice what he apparently wanted to become Todd Bowley's first signing at Chelsea. Really? He even saw potential in the Bowley era? Is this man's judgment of situations that terrible? I mean, give him Simon Cowell's job, and he'd probably create a boy band of five Steve Cooper lookalikes and expect them to sell. Manchester United are signing someone who has failed at every club since leaving Ajax. He has not improved either team. Both sides have gotten drastically worse. Wasn't he supposed to be the best young defender in the world? And yet in April, for a couple of games there, he was being kept out of the Bayern Munich team by Eric Dyer. What is going on? Delit is a fine defender, yes, but he's not Rafael Varane, somebody who is a colossal, legitimately world-class rock star of a centre-back. Come on, when he joined Manchester United, he was off the back of 360 games for Real Madrid, three La Liga titles, four Champions Leagues. It was just three years after he lifted the actual World Cup. His stock in 2021 was far greater than the Litz now. When he joined Manchester United, he was arguably in the top two best defenders in the world. And at just 28 years of age? Yeah, his Manchester United career was such an underwhelming, forgettable trilogy of anonymous seasons that he's now quit the club on the free and nobody cares. Just like when Paul Pogba finally quit. And last I heard, Varane at 31 was locked into talks with Dennis Wise about joining newly promoted Como, which things have real further than getting a pathetic grubby job at QPR. Manchester United destroyed Varane's stock because he's a free agent, available for less than the price of a twirl, and nobody really wants him. Lads, delete. Someone who was voted the best young player in the world five years ago. He doesn't even start for the Netherlands. He was given the Dutch's opening game at the last World Cup against Senegal, but then run on the bench for the rest of that tournament, bar one minute against the USA, and he hasn't played a minute at the Euros. He hasn't started five games in a row for Holland since 2019. And lads, between 2017 and 2019, during the hype years of his career, this man started 21 games in a row for his national team. But over the last five years, his best run was four in 2021 against Turkey, Latvia, Gibraltar, and Scotland. He has started six of Holland's last 25 games, going from 21 in a row to that. See what I mean? MDL has lost his Dutch spot, and Delit and Man United just seem like such a horrendous match because we have established that Delit is a mammoth name who makes no real impact at European giants. In fact, he makes them worse. And Manchester United are the club who, when they get their hands on somebody with world class stock, they manage to reduce their hype to being a puddle of goo. I mean, here is a handful of exciting world class names they have signed since Sir Alex Ferguson quit Angel Di Maria, comfortably one of the best players in the world at Real Madrid. He just lit up the Champions League final. He then goes to Man United and has the end product of milk and quickly flees to PSG. He's lucky he didn't pull a Varane and stay in Manchester for three seasons. Otherwise, he wouldn't be getting offered bags of money at PSG. Now, he had been flogged to the MLS at 30. When Manchester United sent Radimel Falcao, I probably choked on a worm. This is somebody who had scored 70 goals in 91 games for Atletico Madrid. Just two years earlier, he had blown European champions Chelsea off the pitch, scoring a first half hat-trick in the UEFA Super Cup. He was the best centre forward in the world. The Colombian reincarnation of Adriano. He goes to Old Trafford on loan, and I'm thinking, golden boost? Shock him in your fantasy football team now? This is something Real Madrid wanted to sign the previous summer? He was dangerous. No, he was about as weak as a blind tabby cat. Four goals. Four goals! Pathetic! Who else? Casemiro. Seen as the best defensive midfielder in the world at Real Madrid. Yeah, we're two years into his time at Man United. And Jamie Carragher is telling him to go and live in Saudi because he looks like a bloated Pikachu. Jaden Sancho was a phenomenal young talent who in 2020 and 2021, he had the same level of European hype that Delit had in 2019. Every European giant under the sun were linked with him. He goes to Manchester United and look at that. Last season, he was back to square one. Back at Borussia Dortmund on bow. And nowhere near the England squad. Donny van de Beek was Delit's Ajax buddy who was nominated for the Ballon d'Or. He was on the cusp of a move to Real Madrid. He moves to Manchester United, barely gets a kick, and has since been banished to two pointless loan spells at Everton and Eintracht Frankfurt. Again, Paul Pogba, back in 2016. Many people would have tipped him to be the third best player in the world. He was then pathetically average in his six years at Old Trafford, and the best move he could muster afterwards was just like Sancho. Going back to his previous club, Juventus, 
and having to take a huge pay cut. Again, Bastian Schweinsteiger. I was scared for the Premier League when Manchester United prized him out of Bayern Munich just a year after he lifted the World Cup of Germany, playing every single minute in the knockout rounds, including that ridiculous 7-1 destruction of Brazil. Nobody thought his legs were gone. Nobody. And yet, after a year in England, Josie Mourinho had banished him to train with the kids. There is a curse on these huge names when they arrive at Manchester United now. Even Cristiano Ronaldo. Yes, he scored plenty of goals in his return, but he was effectively sacked before Christmas. It was not a happy homecoming. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that every Manchester United signing is destined to be a flop. No, but it's just the ones whose hype was on a world stage. Like, huge colossal names. Like, the list players that every club in Europe are chasing in the past. They, they always fail at Old Trafford now. The only one who didn't over the last 10 years was Latan. The Manchester United success stories are the players who didn't actually have insane hype when they signed. I mean, lads, Bruno Fernandes, before his Manchester United move, was devastated because he didn't get a move to Spurs. So Manchester United are poison for huge world stars, and the lid is a poison for European giants. So these two stay away from each other. They are a bad match. If this was a speed dating event, these two would be the desperate broken people with so much baggage, a catalogue of failed relationships with them being the common denominator. Yeah, please don't get these two crazy weirdos in a room together sharing a pie. They're more likely to headbutt each other than kiss. I can smell the whiff of a delit fail, which is a massive shame because he should work. Fuck, you've been burnt so many times before. He is going to be another Varane. And when he's chewed up and spat out by this club, failing the level up to the hype and wages. People are just gonna call him the Dutch Phil Jones? I can smell it! Alright, that might be their rotting yogurt in my toilet, but still! Still it. Was he ever really that good? Or is he just someone forever on a cycle of making terrible decisions? And I also think that the Copa Trophy might have certain years where that is cursed. It's basically the Ballon d'Or for players under the age of 21. It was only invented in 2018, and surely the shortlists are a clue into who will become epic world stars, right? Well, some years that is true. I mean, the 2021 and 2023 Copa Trophy shortlist were absolute fire. The top three in both years were in different orders, yes, but it was Pedri, Jamal Musiala, and Jude Bellingham. All three sharing the podium in both years, with Musiala being the only unlucky soul who didn't actually get to win. Well, okay, I think we can confirm there's no crazy outliers there. All three have gone from strength to strength and will be three of the best players in the world for at least a decade. I mean, in the first year of the trophy's inception, 2018, it was a mixed bag. The top three were Kylian Mbappe, Christian Pulisic, and Justin Clybert? Yeah, six years later, Real Madrid, AC Milan, and Bournemouth. So that was a very hit and miss year, but in 2019. I'm sorry, but that was the year where the trophy was truly cursed. Third, Jao Felix. Second, Jadon Sancho. First, Matisse de Ligt. Not a single one of those players have lived up to the potential they had in 2019. I mean, I know Felix was at Barcelona last year. Well done, but his career has gone backwards. Christ, well, last year, he was the sequel to Alexander Pato. Some former wonder kid who nobody will ever remember was ever at Chelsea on loan. That year was absolutely cursed. And so, De Ligt and Manchester United. This one is just not going to work. Anyway, that's the video. Let me know what do you think. Let me know in the comments below. Will it work? Will it not? Let me know in the comments. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to give a like, share, and subscribe. As always, I'll talk to you in a while.